Morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on leading through disrupted times. I'm Joe Nagel, and uh, I'm going to hand straight over to Mark O'Keefe, founder of the Innovation Beehive, to talk us through the pathway through uncertainty. Mark, over to you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thanks so much for joining us this morning um, in these incredibly disrupted times. Um, for the, it's lovely to see so many uh, people online here, uh, some we know and some new to the Innovation Beehive. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, just to let you know, the Innovation Beehive was founded 11 years ago by myself, Mark O'Keefe, um, and our mission and the reason we exist is to accelerate potential of individuals, of leaders, of brands, of organisations. Uh, and we're blessed to have a very wide customer base there, some of whom I see are actually on the call today, so great to see so many customers there. Um, and I'm joined today also by Joe Nagel. Do you want to introduce yourself? So are your role yeah. is? So yeah, I'm Innovation Director at the Innovation Beehive, and I'm also uh, kind of sending all the emails out about this, so you'll have all had an email from me at some point in the last few hours to remind you to join, so thank you so much for coming. So we're all uh, operating in very different businesses with different challenges, but I think what we can all agree, actually, um, we, even though we're a very diverse group of people, we have one thing in common. We are absolutely living in incredibly disrupted times. Now, normally, as an innovation business, when we talk about disruption, we would talk about it in the context of, of what Clayton Christensen defined it as, you know, um, from a purely innovation, market, game-changing innovations, product, services, opportunities to serve customers and, and realise new value and revenue. Actually, everyone's using the term disrupted now slightly differently because we are living in what we really call unprecedented times. None of us can help but be impacted or see the impact of COVID-19 on the stock market, the impact of that then on the streets of London with all of us staying home or wherever you are around the world, staying home. And, and you can see there that it's completely empty. I don't know what it says there. Um, and then the impact of that of us staying home to make sure that we protect the NHS and save lives but all of us are finding new ways of working. Um, and here's a little uh, us uh, example there of people finding new ways of working, whether it's Zoom or WebEx, but all of us across the globe, no matter what our backgrounds, our class, our employment status, we are all living through this shared dilemma of disrupted times. Now, as a community of leaders or people who are interested in leadership, uh, we want to just understand before we break into our point of view around these disruptive times, a little bit around some of the things that are really impacting you. What's the, what's the biggest disruption going on in your business at the moment? So we're going to launch a little poll here and there are some options. So Joe, do you want to take me through the options? Sure. So um, as you can see from the poll that should have appeared on your screen and uh, we've had one incident where it didn't appear. So if nothing has appeared on your screen, I'll read through the options and you can also uh, comment on the chat box as to which one you think is the biggest disruption at the moment. So we've got remote working and connecting with your team. Uh, we've got loss of revenue. Uh, we've got interference to the supply chain. Uh, we've got productivity of non-furloughed employees, so people who are still in the business but maybe working from home. Um, and you could also count yourself in that potentially. <laughs> uh, cash flow, uh, connecting with customers. And then I've also put other. So if there's something else, feel free to find the chat box and uh, comment that into the chat box. And I'll just keep an eye on that uh, as we're doing the poll. Um, but I can see most of you um, have the poll in front of you because I can see that you're completing it. So that's great. Um, and we've got a, a fairly mixed bag coming through at the moment, I think it's fair to say, but we'll share it in a couple of seconds. So um, I think the majority of people have... Um, oh, a couple more votes coming more through. More votes coming in. Give it a few more seconds. Okay, I think that's, that's pretty good. We've got a fair few people completed it. So let's end that and um, I'll share the results. So you should be able to see them on your screen now. So a couple of people have actually said other. So if you find the chat box, it would be great to know what your biggest disruption is going on at the moment. Um, and I can see that loss of revenue is a really significant one for people with a third of people picking that as their, their biggest disruption. I can imagine that most of us would have wanted to pick more than one if we could from this list, right? Um, but, uh, and then also connecting with customers is proving challenging for a few people. Um, productivity of non-furloughed employees and also cash flow. So, you know, I can see, you can see from that that there are a, a number of challenges. But the one that, interestingly, one that is sticking out there for not being selected is remote working and connecting with teams. And I think that's testament to how quickly we've adapted mm. as, a, as a society to this virtual and remote working. 
Um, so yeah, I think I think that's, that's quite an interesting. Yeah, absolutely, very interesting to see there. Um, and I, I'll be interested if we find out what the other ones are later on. But we're all um, in different industries. We're all of different levels and have different responsibilities in the organisation. And our industries and our organisation may be impacted differently. Um, so, so what I'm hearing is that actually the loss of revenue and connectivity with the customers is a big one there. Um, so what do you do when no one knows what to do? And that's the challenge we're hopefully trying to work through with you this morning. And what is your role as a leader in the organization, whether you're a leader of self, whether you're a leader of teams, or whether you're a leader that has significant executive impact across the whole organization, what do you do when no one really knows what the rules are? There is no playbook to help us work through this, but we have had previous examples of massive disruption throughout history, whether it's economic uh, town downs, uh, whether it is uh, the Spanish, uh, Spanish flu, we've had absolute examples throughout history that we can learn from. Actually, before COVID-19 impacted to all our lives so significantly, we were conducting a piece of research at the Innovation Beehive for about 18 months um, into how leaders lead during disrupted times. We called it Leadership 4.0, a new way of leading in disrupted times. At that point, we were talking about disruption in terms of disrupting on markets, thinking about the impact of AI, machine learning, new models, new innovations, and how it's going to impact on the leader's role. However, reviewing it in the light of COVID-19, we think there are still some lessons to be learned. We'll be sending out an updated version of Leadership 4.0 to everyone who's registered and who is on this call. But those leaders told us about five practices that they maintained to help them through disruption. The first is what they call leading in head. And this is about business metrics. This is the functional side of running a business. It's about putting processes in place it's about having your finances in place and really understanding the nuts and bolts of managing a PL, managing your people and running a business on a day-to-day -day functional basis. Alongside that, leaders also talked about the practice of leading in heart. And this is about engaging your people, connecting them in with a higher purpose and understanding what motivates them and how they can be their best possible selves at work. The third practice we identified in Leadership 4.0 is leading in health. And this is about concerned about people's well-being, and this is concerned about people's resilience. It's about being able to spot issues around health, being able to stop issues around people feeling uh, mental practices and um, being impacted at mental health. And you can see that these first three practices, leading in head, leading in heart, and leading in health, are part of the dialogue at the moment around COVID-19. The fourth practice, leading in habit, I think is coming to the fore more and more. We are delivering this to you over a WebEx in a dining room. When we launched Leadership 4.0, we launched it initially a few weeks ago before COVID-19 impacted, and we were all told to, to live at home, at Google's Academy in London. We've had to change the habits of how we operate and how we communicate with our customers and our team, and everyone as a leader is experiencing that as well. Leaders in 4.0 are adaptable and flexible in their habits. They're able to change their habits. They might establish a habit on Monday, and then as a result of COVID-19 or new information or new data coming to the fore, they might have to change what they said on Monday and adapt on Wednesday. And more and more, this leading in habit practice is a central part of leading through the disruption of COVID-19. But all of the ways we lead at the moment, whether it's functionally in head, whether it's how we connect in with our people, whether we check on their well-being and their resilience, or whether we're flexible in the processes and our expectations of our team, will be deposits in our leadership legacy and actually will impact how we lead in history. How we get through this and how we're remembered at the other end and how engaged, how motivated and how trusted people feel in us as leaders will be as a result of how we behave and the history we create and the way we behave over the coming weeks. One of the key things that we're holding as leaders is, is, is what's known as the Stockdale Paradox. And those of you who have read Jim Collins' Good to Great book will be aware that um, Jim Stockdale, he was a uh, Vietnam veteran. He was a prisoner of war during Vietnam. And he was also um, a vice president candidate in the United States. And he talked about the paradox that kept him going through terrible times when he was in the Vietnam prisoner of war camp. His lessons for leadership and his lessons for being resilient 
and his lessons for going through difficult times and coming out the other end was, you have to have faith that you'll prevail in the end, regardless of the difficulties, and at the same time must confront the most brutal facts of our current reality, whatever they might be. And that's the challenge, I think, that leaders are holding at the moment. And, and we've kind of called it the COVID-19 paradox. At one point, you are having to inspire and engage your people, keep them motivated, keep them engaged, whether it's people who are non-furloughed or whether it's people who are actually furloughed, having some level of interaction with them and keeping them well and sane and safe. At the same time, you're having to be very honest about the actual economic state of the business. So how do you balance that between being very brutally honest about the negative impact of this virus on your business and at the same time motivate and engage people? And within that paradox in COVID-19, how do you operate in the now and operate in the future? And that is why this WebEx is called leading through disrupted times and not leading in. It's really important that a leader is present in the issue they're dealing with now, but is also able to help their team and themselves look forward to a future beyond COVID-19. And there will be some key skills and some key questions that the leadership community needs to answer and to learn to be able to lead through these uncertain times. So looking at, at histories of pandemics, Spanish flu, economic downtown, when there have been major, major impacts on society and globally, we've identified that usually organizations and societies go through a series of stages. And these four stages we call the pathway through uncertainty. We hope as leaders, it will give you a way to operate in the now and also give you an opportunity to think through where you might operate in the future and how you might take your people with you. The first we call stabilize. This was a stage actually we've already been through. This is about steadying the ship. This was about, we'll talk a bit more detail, but this is about making sure the business can still function and operate. The second stage, which we believe we're in now, is called sustain. This is about how do you carry on operating and keep your energy and keep your resilience levels up and keep spotting new opportunities whilst we're in these disrupted times. Sustain, we don't know how long that will go on for and it may get tougher and tougher as we carry on during the lockdown. The third is return. This is when we start to return to some semblance of normality. Now, there's lots of discussion in the press at the moment about when that will happen. And various countries across the world are having various different levels of lockdown lifted or phased return. It's probably right to imagine that we will have a level of phased return here in the United Kingdom. Um, and that will impact how we interact with our teams, whether we're working on shifts, whether we do part time, whatever we might do. But we'll have to plan how people return to work and how we return to serving our customers. And then the fourth stage of the pathway through uncertainty is called renew. And this is about whilst we are conscious and aware of what's happened, we've celebrated and taken time to understand what we've learned from the period of time we've been through with COVID-19. It's about looking forward and not being stuck um, where you are in terms of a business that's gone through the battering that coronavirus is giving us. It's about establishing new goals, looking forward and exploiting new opportunities. So I'm gonna take some time to go through each of those stages with you. And if you have any comments or any questions, please do put them into the chat section. And we've got a couple of formal questions we're gonna be asking in the chat section as well. So thinking about the first stage, stabilize, and thinking about the questions and the new skills that leaders needed to be able to move through the stabilized phase. The key questions a leader would be asking at this stage is basically what is happening? There was so much information and so much disinformation and so much uncertainty around actually what the impact of COVID-19 would be. I remember being on holiday at the end of January in the Canary Islands and knowing that somebody, in an, one person in an island nearby had the coronavirus. I had absolutely no understanding that it, within a matter of weeks, it would impact on my projects, it would impact so it's so explicitly on my clients and ultimately impact on my people and where I would be working. So constantly people were trying to make sense of what was going on, which was incredibly stressful as leaders. And as leaders also, we're used to having the answers. When people come to us and say, what's going on? Usually these would give them some sense of an answers. 
But in this, in this, in this pandemic, we were all actually, it was incredibly egalitarian. We were all reduced to hearing information on Twitter, on our news feeds, and having no more information than our colleagues had. And some leaders struggled with that, about moving into being able to say, I don't know, and I'll explain what I do know, but this is a moving feast. The key thing leaders had to answer at this phase was around how do they continue to operate the business while this is happening. And people then started implementing a lot of their business, if they had them, business continuity plans, looking at what processes they needed to put into the business, what IT solutions were required, looking at financial modelings, the impacts of market closing, impacts of customers uh, not being able to pay their bills or not being able to access them during current business models. And then as we got more and more into what potentially was going to be the implications that we're all in now about people working from home and then the coronavirus job retention scheme, a real process there on HR and legal regulations. I had a question here from Richard. Would a pre-stabilized phase be relevant, such as survival or acceptance? I think probably actually survival is, is, is a nice way actually of describing stabilize as well. And I think in terms of the behavior of acceptance, there is a point, you know, it, it almost follows a bit like the grief curve. There comes a point where you, you have to accept what is happening to you. And there were various levels of, of individuals' acceptance. As I said, we're all, we're all human, all gone through this in a terribly egalitarian way at the moment. But nice comment, keep them coming, we love it, thank you. So stabilize was literally around um, surviving, making sure that the business could carry on operating. We then have moved into the phase we're in now, uh, which is called sustain. And this is about operating your business under exceptional and unusual circumstances. So the first questions that leaders needed to answer in this question was, how do we keep working through this? Now, we're an organization that runs traditionally in, in, in classroom consulting projects or in classroom training projects. Uh, some remote capability, but not huge amounts of remote capability. We had to keep functioning. We've switched our consulting projects online. We're building a digital online training program around innovation design thinking. Every organization has said, how do I carry on working through this? How do, I, how do I keep the doors open if I can and continue to create revenue through this as well? More and more though, we are coming up with new challenges across every level of the organization, which forces us to come up with new solutions. We can, even the most strategic and the best operational minds on the planet, are unable to put ourselves a week, two weeks, or three weeks ahead and understand every single challenge and potential opportunity that will come as a result of coronavirus. So we are encountering a whole load of new problems and new opportunities on a weekly and a daily basis. And that requires a new skill set. We believe that actually the skill set that's most required at the moment, right across the organization, whether you're a CEO or whether you're a frontline hourly paid worker, is the skills that are usually contained in the innovators toolkit. This is around creative problem solving, around thinking agilely and adapting. So many of us have had to adapt our ways of working, the place that we work, our patterns of working, our productivity, the tools that we use. And we're actually building a huge adaptability um, uh, capability in a lot of organizations. What's important also with that is to know that we will make mistakes. So innovators are great at prototyping something very quickly, trying it out, building it, testing it, learning from it, the failures and the successes, and then iterating. So that skill of being able to fail, fail fast, fail in public, and learn is something we're all having to learn. We're all having to be, I guess, more humble about making mistakes. And as leaders, we're having to accept that the, the edict or the guidance we gave on Monday, because information may change, may well change on Wednesday. And we're having to prototype and iterate our advice and our tools and our techniques and our offers as we navigate through these uncertain times. The most important thing also is that we don't just stop that we continue to exploit and explore opportunity. There will be people who will win. There are organizations who will absolutely thrive through this. Those who are able to really understand what their customers need now, those who are able to get real insight into what is happening, 
I think that, you know, in 2021, there'll be a whole plethora of new successful startups and possibly even unicorns that are born out of this crisis, who spotted the opportunity and are able to exploit it with a product or a service or an experience that will lead to their individual growth. I mean, personally, the Innovation Beehive was started in 2008 during, during the financial crash. Um, and, you know, here we are 11, 12 years later with a business that may be, you know, living through disrupted times, but certainly would never have happened if I hadn't spotted the opportunity in the financial crash. The key thing as a leader here also um, is to make sure that you connect in with your people and are really aware of their resilience levels. We talked about leading in health. So often we've heard about organizations and colleagues and, uh, sorry, and clients um, who set up daily check-ins or set up team meetings, et cetera. But we're hearing more and more that people are being overloaded, being overwhelmed with the amount of virtual check-ins and the amount of virtual chats that we, have to, that we have to go through. And everyone at the beginning of these meetings says, hey, how are you? Yeah, I'm fine, good, carry on. Actually, as a leader, it's really important just to listen and to check in one-on-one -on -one to make sure people really are okay. It's really important that you make it okay for people not to be okay. Because people still may not feel comfortable by being public about how they're actually feeling. The pressures of working from home, the pressures of all of us seeing our own de decor or hearing our dogs in the background or our kids that need feeding at lunchtime, whether or not I'm expected to be on a budget call at that time, can impact people's well-being, their wellness, their mental health as well. So taking some time out one-on-one -on -one, as well as collectively check in with people to make sure that they are sustained throughout this process is really important. One way of creating that psychologically safe space where it's okay not to be okay is to talk openly as a leader about how you are feeling and what you are experiencing. I had some experience where, you know, I'm known as someone who's very energetic. In my last organization, my nickname was Tigger. There was no one more energetic or, or busy uh, than Mock O'Keefe. Yep. You know, quite early on in this pandemic, I had a bit of a bad day. I had a Wednesday. I wasn't feeling very well. I had a bit of a sore throat. Thought I might have a bit of a temperature. So I self-isolated. And actually, I was okay. I came back to work the next day. And on our first team meeting, people were checking in, saying, are you okay? You know, have you got COVID-19? And it's clear I hadn't. But what I did say is I wasn't okay yesterday. I wasn't feeling great. I need to take a little bit of time out. And hopefully I created a space then where people were able to talk about how they were feeling and how they might navigate through it. So to, in order to be able to sustain our way through this, as well as looking out for um, what skills we need and what new opportunities there are and making sure we lead in health, there's a couple of tools I want to share with you. We at the Innovation Beehive believe passionately in the power of stimulus, trying to find in a related world some examples um, or some tools or techniques or principles that we can apply for our clients in their particular challenge. And looking out there in related worlds at the moment, individuals who've dealt with very difficult and very tricky situations and have had to make uh, adapted decisions, there's none more that, that came to our fore than the dogfighters in World War II. And they practice what we call the OODA loop. The OODA loop, when practiced by dogfighters in World War II, resulted in those who practiced it uh, surviving more battles than those who didn't. And as leaders, it's something we, I would advise that we do on a daily basis now, that we observe what data do you currently have in front of you? Is, is this the most valid data available? And what has changed in the data set since you last saw it? Then, orientate. What do you surmise from what's happening from the data that's in front of you at this particular time. But also be very conscious that you might bring some unconscious bias, some filters to it, your own emotional state, what's happened over the last couple of hours, what you've read in the news. Try and be conscious of that and take that out when you're orientating and looking at the data. Once you've looked at the data from that pure play state, you'll be able to decide what your response should be and then act and implement this response and implement your decision. And going through that loop, it gives you a four stages to be able to then make sense of what is happening and the data that's in front of you. Have you got a question coming yeah, in? Yeah, I've, I've got a couple of comments that have come through, Mark, and I just want to share them uh, with, with the rest of the group on the call. Um, so when you were talking about um, the, uh, the, the sort of mental health piece and, mm -hmm. um, you know, showing, showing up 
and showing as a leader that you are human too, etc. Well, Alison commented earlier about um, their biggest challenge being around um, some, some staff working from home and some staff in the community um, and staff working from home not always being as empathetic of colleagues working in the community. And I, I just wonder, I thought as you were talking about the um, mm. uh, relationship between leaders showing themselves and being open to themselves, I wondered if there might be something in that for, for Alison uh, and for the teams that, that are working from home versus the, the teams working in the community. And maybe there's, there's something around empathy as well. Something about empathy, absolutely, and around ha having a dialogue about each of those, each of those particular stakeholders being open and honest around the barriers and the challenges that they have, uh, the risks that they're undertaking and the impact upon them. And also not being judgmental, not saying, be, you know, you're at less risk because you're doing that or you're, you know, you're, you're, you're being more of the hero as a result of doing that. It's not about judging, it's about supporting. And I think the way we can get to a place of supporting as opposed to judging is about, it's about clearly exploring and articulating how are each of you feeling, each of these stakeholder groups, what are the challenges that you're coming up against and what are your coping mechanisms? And I think then also, and is there anything that you can learn from each other to be able to move through this? Mm, great, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then there was also a comment from Alan that said some, some industries have um, already put significant capability in place to deal with disaster. And, and I know um, that the bank Alan works for um, has been actually sharing some of that capability with their third sector clients. Um, so they've, they've been sort of putting that out there to the world, which I think is, is really brilliant. So, you know, those of us who have some of that capability seem to be quite open about sharing it at the moment as well, which is, which is fantastic. Yeah, we've had clients who almost haven't missed a beat. They've just got this built-in innovation capability and this agile mindset. They've pivoted slightly potentially in their business model and how they offer. But others, uh, organizations, other clients who, who don't have that capability, it may be taking a little bit longer to find out what they can do and how they can operate to some extent during COVID-19. And of course, there are other clients and other organizations who are just being massively impacted by the lockdown and by the fact we can't travel and, and will carry on being impacted by the impact of social distancing. And, and yeah, absolutely. And Vanessa has just asked the question about the OODA loop. Uh, what's the relationship between analyzing the data and being more intuitive? Is that the relationship between observe and orient? Yeah, absolutely. That yeah. point there is about intuitive. There, there is, um, that is a bit around sort of what do I take in and then what is my decision? And the thing is, now more than ever, as I said, you as leaders, we're usually expected and probably we expect of ourselves to be able to come up with the answers. We may not have the right answer on Wednesday afternoon. We have the best answer that we can have with the data in front of us. And I think every decision and every, every answer we give to our, 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 our stakeholders needs to have that caveat. And that's not about removing accountability. That's about setting up that this may change if new data comes in, I have to orientate slightly differently and therefore make a decision. And if you have that skill of adaptability, innovation and agility, you will expect and be able to turn with it and pivot with it. If it's not something that you know or you haven't learned, because you can definitely learn these skills, then you will find it more difficult as an individual and as an organization to be able to make that zig to the left and zag to the right um, because you're, you're, you know, it's like turning that tanker or that speedboat. So talking about that idea of kind of creating uh, innovation capability in organization, often when we work with clients, they ask us to help them, you know, solve a particular challenge, uh, or they ask us to, to teach them in, in teams of leaders, for example, how to drive an innovation culture. Um, and we teach a process called design thinking. More and more, because we're having to adapt, we're all, no matter what level, or what role we play in an organization, having to be more agile and come up with solutions to problems we could never predict a week or even 24 hours before. We believe that the skills of the innovator are required by everyone in the organization. We're calling it innovation for all. Um, there are five stages, and again, there's more detail which we found on our website and our YouTube page about this. But the first stage is about really trying to uncover the insight about what is actually going on here in terms of looking at the broader stakeholders, looking at what customers are saying, what's going on in the marketplace, and gathering insight from all of the different variable factors. So you're not just looking at it with your lens. Bringing all that together to say what is actually happening and defining what the opportunity is and what the real problem is that you're trying to solve before thirdly moving into the idea generation phase right what potential solutions do i have to this 
and then rapidly prototyping that solution, building something scrappy and testing it, trying it before you actually then sort of say, right, this works, what do I learn? What do I iterate before coming up with your final best process or best practice this week or this day, knowing that as you're presented with new information in the OODA loop, it might all change. It's about behaving at the beginning very expansively, looking out there to really understand what's going on before becoming more reductive and saying, these are the problems I need to solve and then idea generating to create solutions that you know your prototype and iterate and have to keep prototyping and iterating. So the process of design thinking, which is often used by marketeers or product developers or experienced developers to create a new product, service or experience for end users, actually now is a key skill for everyone in the organization. So as we carry on working through sustain, leaders using the OODA loop to help them make decisions and in, inform their actions, and everyone in the organization learning the skills of innovation and coming up with solutions to new problems, we will get to a point where we'll move into return. As I say, we all know this, this may be a phased return. This may be you know, that we have people working in shifts. We may have 50% of a team working on a Monday and 50% of a team working on a Tuesday. Lots of different options are being modeled and forecasted by our clients at the moment. And we're having lots of conversations with clients around how they might best return to this uh, to, to work. Key questions that the leader needs to answer at this point is what does my customer need? We don't know exactly when we'll come out of this. And we don't know what the world or our market will look like when we come out of this. But what we do know is everyone has and will be impacted. We know it will definitely impact on customers' expectations and it may impact on customers' needs. Just thinking about, you know, um, digital offerings. So the fact is that, you know, Joe runs a church on Sundays using the Zoom platform for the Innovation Beehive. And you've got octogenarians joining on Zoom calls and having conversations over them. So the impact on telecommunications and the market opportunities and people's acceptance of this new digital capability will be huge. People who've never done online banking or never done online shopping are now having to embrace online banking and online shopping. So new opportunities there. There are probably going to be some expectations around hygiene, around preventative medicine. You know, if you're working in the food, hospitality or travel business, what are the implications around people going to have holidays abroad? Are people going to be saying that actually the new luxury is staying home? And then what are the customer, what customers required to have their, their staycations as opposed to staying at home because they're staying at home to stay alive? Um, and I guess ultimately customers' expectations will have shifted and you need a way to understand what people need. Because of the, the lockdown and the impact on travel, there have been massive restrictions um, on supply chains. So organizations will have to rebuild their supply chain. Some of them will have been completely disrupted as suppliers have gone out of business um, or, or, or you know, as various countries around the world increase or decrease their travel restrictions. There'll be a real impetus to, to return to their supply chain and get it up and running as quickly as possible. And to do that, to deliver on the new customer's expectations and rebuild your supply chain, you will need a differently structured organization. You know, many organizations in the UK are taking advantage of the UK um, job retention scheme. It is very likely that once we come out of that, there'll be significant restructuring in the organization, redundancies, layoffs, people moving to different contracts and different terms and conditions to respond to what the market needs and what the cash position is in the organization. A couple of skills and behaviors that we think leaders will need to be able to effectively move through the return phase. The first is really understand what's going on in the customer's mind around the big issues that they're dealing with and how they might choose or not choose to interact with your current product, service or brand. To do that, you really have to have strong empathy and insight gathering, the key first stage of design thinking and creative problem solving. You may have to, you may have pivoted your business model. You may have adapted very successfully or partly successfully over the lockdown period. Chances are you'll probably have to pivot again. You'll probably have to change your offering to respond to emerging customers' needs and customers' expectations. There'll also be change, changing expectations of employees. Maybe, they, um, maybe it'll be harder for them to hit the ground running as soon as they return to work. Maybe there'll be conversations around terms and conditions around their expectations of what they want out of work. 
So that key skill of HR management and team building will be important for a leader to be able to demonstrate. And we also think it's important when we go through the return phase to just stop and pause and recognize with your team and as an individual what you've been through. Who have been the heroes? Um, what have you learned? How have you managed to keep resilient? What have you learned around things that didn't go well? Are there opportunities to learn from that as well? When we all go back in the return phase, day one won't be the same as day one was five or six months ago. We need to stop and pause and recognize what has happened and celebrate the achievements that we've had over the last few months. And that will then allow us to start being more forward focused because we can draw a line in the sand and start to think about renewing, which is the final stage of um, the pathway through uncertainty. In this renewal phase, there are some key questions that the line manager needs to be thinking. How do I rebuild the collective spirit of my people? You may have different faces. You may not have the entire team that you had before. You may have people who've lost their loved ones or who feel battered and bruised. Their well-being has been affected by coronavirus. How do you bring those people together? How do you align them behind the purpose of your organization, which may or may not need to be reviewed? How do you make sure that you carry on living those values that are so important to your success of the organization? And how do you bring people on a journey to move forward and not be stuck in where they are now? And then as we've all learned to adapt and work from home um, and be much more digital savvy, I think we have in exponentially increased the digital capability of the United Kingdom and Ireland's population. So how do you go about leveraging that as part of your digital transformation program in your organization? Don't lose the positive digital capabilities that's come out of COVID-19. Couple of skills that you'll need as a leader to be able to help guide people, people through this renewal phase is being very goal orientated, reviewing what the customer's expectations were in return, setting a new strategy, a new course, and then having new goals for, for individuals to be able to accomplish. Aligning your people behind what you can achieve in terms of your new strategy, new customer um, expectations, and your new business model. You may have to negotiate quite heavily with people around working patterns with suppliers as you set up your new supply chain. Certainly there'll be legal regulations you'll need to negotiate your way through with all of your stakeholders. But the ability to inspire and take people through to this new door will be vital as a leader. You'll still be holding that Stockdale paradox and you'll be holding it right the way through all of these four stages. But the one thing I think that really has come out as a positive of this is that digital transformation. If you can capitalize on the fact that so many people are as digital savvy now, far more than they were before the lockdown, you have an opportunity to really exploit that, that, that area of your business. So we're gonna do a bit of a whiteboard, aren't we, Joe? Uh, so I'm gonna hand over to you. Yeah. I'll do that afterwards. Oh. Uh, yeah, so actually the, um, what we want to do now is think about as an employee, what are the moments of truth in your, in your employee life cycle as you come back through the renewal cycle? So there are, we're all got back into the office, we've all sat together, you know, I'm looking around at there are some faces that weren't there before, before there are some faces that were there before that aren't there and they have left the organization and maybe taken some extended leaves of absence, whatever it is, as a leader, I have people in front of me on their first day, or I have people together with me in their first team meeting, or I'm sitting down with one of my colleagues in our first one-to-one. -one. What do I do as a leader to make sure that I'm able to listen to that person, to recognize what's happened, to talk them through that Stockdale paradox, where the business is now, but what the future of that business might be, align them towards the strategy, agree goals and objectives with them that make them forward facing to move on. We've identified three moments of truth there in the employee experience. Um, and uh, we were just wondering on a whiteboard if we could have a, a, a bit of a, a collaboration to say what other moments of truth that a leader and employees might experience on the employee journey as we move through the renew phase. So if you like to, uh, put your uh, answers to that question in the chat. 
uh, we can put them on the whiteboard and we'll send the whiteboard out to everyone after this session. So as well, we've got the kind of the first day, the first team meeting and the first one to one. Can you think of any other moments of truth that individuals might go through as we move to the renew phase and start moving forward? Oh, a lovely comment from Amy there. Thank you, Amy. Your pathway through uncertainty is really helpful for Amy. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you'll all be receiving a white paper which has more details, has all the questions, all the skills and behaviours, um, and also uh, the map as well as a separate piece. So anyone got any thoughts around potentially what moments are true? I'm, what, what do you think? I think, I think and, and, and just sort of, yeah, thinking of it as a sort of customer journey. So where, where are the touch points? If you're buying something on Amazon or walking around a supermarket, what are the different moments of truth that lead you to a purchase? Now we're thinking about what are the moments of truth on an employee journey that lead us to feel engaged, productive, and, uh, and back and renewed, ready to go. We've got Vanessa, see the reality of the lost revenue and the challenge ahead. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. The first time that you have that conversation, maybe it's in your first finance meeting, your first P&L meeting, looking at the spreadsheet and the budgets, that will be a moment of truth, absolutely. Um, negative experience of staff, I be empathetic, you know, want. yeah, really important to have that skill of empathy actually and understanding, uh, and um, understanding their truth, what they have been through, uh, and as a leader, listening to that, and then helping them work through that and align back into what you need them to do uh, in the organization. Uh, first contact with a client. That's a fantastic yeah, one there, Richard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and being together for the first time, for the first, with colleagues for the first yeah, time. Yeah, being together for the first time. Yeah. When someone comes to give you a hug at the beginning of a meeting, how are you going to make sure that you don't recoil? Uh, <laughs> first moments together in person after mm -hmm. social distancing. You know, we're, we're quite used to actually living probably little smaller worlds that we were before. You know, how many of us will feel anxious getting off the tube or getting off a plane? I mean, I was traveling three, four airplane trips a month. Didn't think about it. You know, mm -hmm. I might be in London on a Wednesday. I might be in Scotland on a Friday. I'm supposed to be in Florida at the moment. And then next week I'm supposed to be in New York. How will I feel the first time I step off a plane and go into a meeting? where someone says, I haven't seen you for months, Mark, and gives me a hug. Mm. Those moments are and, really important. And actually, when people arrive at work after having done the commute for the first time yes. in months or two yeah. weeks. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's also one for me, which is around um, people who've been furloughed, who are coming back to work. Mm. And not, not only are they uh, coming back from working from home, but they're actually coming back to, to doing work. So yeah. Um, yeah. There's, there's possibly slightly different challenges for, the, for, for those colleagues. Yeah, so have they maybe been in, in, in uh, gear one or two work-wise or not even at all in gear work-wise? They've been, you know, homeschooling, they've been with their partner, uh, maybe they've been one of the people I've seen on Facebook saying how much Netflix and baking they're doing, whatever it might be. And then so that was on a, on, a, on a Wednesday and on a Friday, you expect them to attend a team meeting and make a presentation about what they, how they're going to work over the next couple of months to to respond to all of this customer data you've given them the day before. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a step change and a change in gear for individual. As leaders, you're going to have to be able to help people through that sympathetically, empathetically, whilst at the same time making sure we're delivering what the business needs us to deliver. So, yeah, um, someone has said about um, bereavements bereavement yeah. of, of, of colleagues and coming back and seeing the desk for the first time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I was on a, a call yesterday. I'm a fellow of uh, St George's House at Windsor Castle, and we had a fellows meeting yesterday. And one of the one of the fellows um, has attended two funerals virtually over the last couple of months. A very good friend um, and and a colleague. And uh, there was a real moment actually on that call where we we were all being sympathetic and empathetic, but I. I didn't know what to say. Mm -hmm. um, it's a completely new world where somebody's not even to, able to enter into that, into that moment of mourning. So we'll all have to be prepared to have very difficult and uncomfortable and probably emotionally draining conversations. Our individual resilience as leaders is not only being tested now, it will continue to be tested over the coming months, particularly in this return and this renew phase, as people will look to us to help them through getting back to whatever the new normal is. Mm -hmm. Super. Great. Well, thank you so much. We've got some great examples there. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll send that out as part of the, as part of the, the, the post session. Um, so really, 
going back to the five practices that I saw in Leadership 4.0, which is more relevant now than it has ever been, and certainly more relevant than we launched it in the beginning of March this year at Google. The way we behave now towards our people and the way we behave towards ourselves and towards our customers will create our, our, our leadership legacy. It will ultimately be the history by which we are remembered. Um, it's, we are all living in, in incredibly disruptive times, but taking a moment out to be honest, to listen to people, to accept as a leader that you don't have all the answers, using some of the tools and techniques like the OODA loop, helping your people adapt and be agile using creative problem solving techniques, catching whether or not people's resilience and well-being is being disrupted and impacted by the lockdown. This will all impact on, on your leadership bank, how people are engaged with you once we get into return and renew, how much they trust you, and how much they're willing to go with you to renew and build the organization uh, back up to what the opportunities it can be. So thank you so much for, um, for that and, and for your interaction, your engagement, your comments in the chat um, and for your taking part in the whiteboard there and the polls. It's been great to share our thinking with you. Uh, we hope it's been useful and hopefully it's accelerated some of the potential you have as a leader as you, as you live through this. The most important thing to remember is you're living through it, not in it. As leaders, we have to take our people with us and take them through it. We know we've been through stabilize. We're now in sustain. We will get to return. And then we have to future face forward into renew. So a couple of things we want to share with you there. Um, we're running a webinar next week on creative problem solving. So those tools and techniques that we believe, not just innovators, that everyone in the organization now needs. And I'll be leading that with our capability director, Zach Curtis. So book that in for next Thursday and more details are to follow. And also we've set up a virtual WhatsApp group. Joe, do you want to tell them how to join? So very easy to join. If you're not a member already, simply open the camera app on your phone and uh, put it in front of it, hover it over that QR code, and then it'll invite you to open the link to join the group. And you're more than welcome to join. It's a place where we share uh, best practice, um, stories, little bits of fun uh, around the life of working from home and virtual working. Uh, there was a great video on there last night actually that someone shared about um, what, what, what if, a, if a Zoom meeting was happening in real life, what it would be like. It's hilarious. Yes, it's everything from comedy through to Harvard Business Review. Yeah. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and I know we've had some very positive feedback from people saying, I'm loving the WhatsApp group. Mm -hmm. So please do feel welcome to join. If you have any questions at all after today, do email us at hello at innovation beehive.com. We'll be sending out um, a recording of this. It will also be on our YouTube channel, our Leadership 4.0 updated white paper leading in COVID times and the pathway to help you navigate through uncertainty. So thank you very much for your attention. Hopefully we'll see you online next Thursday. Stay safe and be strong. Thanks everyone. Bye.